Hello everyone, this is Sirius Trivia, and today we're starting a brand new Let's Talk Lore series covering Liu Bei's early life, spanning from his birth in 161 until his escape to the Jin province in the year 201. While 40 years might seem like a wide span to be classified as early life, Liu Bei's ascension to becoming the founding emperor of the kingdom of Shu Han happened mostly in the last two decades of his life, and as we have already covered Liu Bei's later periods in our Battle of Chibi, Taming of the Shu, the Battle for Hanzhong, and the Yiling Campaign series, it is only fitting for us to complete Liu Bei's life story with this series. So in our first episode here, titled Lineage, let's first take a look at the validity of Liu Bei's imperial bloodline claim. Now according to Liu Bei, his clan traces its line back to Prince Liu Sheng of the Western Han Dynasty. And to put this claim into perspective, Liu Bei was born in the year 161, and Liu Sheng was made into the Prince of Zhongshan by his father, Emperor Liu Qi, on June 25th in the year 154 BCE which means Liu Bei's claim to the imperial bloodline has a 315-year time gap. More importantly, Liu Sheng was also famous for having 120 sons, which make him a rather convenient ancestor to claim, given the fact that Liu Bei was born in the Zhuo Commandery, which neighbors the princedom of Zhongshan. Now, while both the long time gap and Liu Sheng's fertility are common reasons that people use to cast doubts on Liu Bei's claim, there are some additional facts that provide support. First, Liu Bei's claim does go farther than just Prince Liu Sheng, as it states that Liu Bei's line comes from Liu Sheng's fifth son, Liu Zhen, who was the Marquis of Lucheng. And Lucheng happens to be a small town in the Zhuo Commandery, not far from where Liu Bei was born. Furthermore, it was also recorded that in the year 112 BCE, Liu Zhen would lose his nobility title when the purity of gold sent by him as tribute to the imperial court failed to reach the required standard. This meant, starting with Liu Zhen, Liu Bei's line would essentially be no different from a commoner, which would partially explain why Liu Bei was born into poverty. And for those who are confused on how nobility titles work during the Han Dynasty, essentially the sons of the emperor who are not in line to inherit the throne will all get princedom titles once they come of age. This princedom title gives them a parcel of land that could be as big as a few commanderies in size or as small as just a city, all depending on how much your father, the emperor, loves you. Now, while this land becomes your princedom, you do not actually rule over this land, as the imperial court will be appointing chancellors to manage the princedom affairs, much like how administrators are assigned for commanderies. Your job as the prince is merely to stay within your assigned land and enjoy the tax revenues from a predetermined set amount of households within your title land. So in essence, your princedom is your luxury prison, where you had to stay for the rest of your life, but you're supplemented with a set amount of tax revenues from the household residing in your princedom. Now, because of the longevity of the Han Dynasty, this structure presented multiple problems as with each passing generation, a new batch of princedom needed to be created while well, the previous princedoms usually remained as long as that prince had at least one son to inherit the princedom. And in the case of Liu Sheng, he had 120 sons. So while only one of them will get the princedom title, the remaining sons will still get marquis titles. And with all these titles being created, the state loses more and more of its taxable base. Therefore, the imperial court develop a series of tribute requirements to not only recruit portions of the lost tax revenues, but also as a potential way to strip nobility titles outright. 
much like in the case with Liu Bei's ancestor, Liu Zhen, whose tribute fell short. Now, with all this said, there is actually no way for us to know for certain the validity of Liu Bei's claim. And to be honest, the claim itself doesn't even make Liu Bei special, as his line is more than 300 years removed from the main line of the ruling family, and for more than 270 years of those 300 years, his line lived as commoners. Therefore, I don't think Liu Bei had too many incentives to fabricate this claim, as I personally believe that Liu Bei, at the very least, genuinely believed in his own claim. And with Liu Bei's lineage debate cleared up, let's return to our lore series and start covering some of Liu Bei's more tangible forefathers starting with his grandfather, Liu Xiong, who was recorded to have received a court recommendation in his youth, which eventually landed him the job as the mayor of the Fan County in the Dong Commandery. Yet his son and Liu Bei's father, Liu Hong, was not able to build upon his father's success as he would die young, leaving behind Liu Bei and his mother without a source of income. Which is why Liu Bei grew up poor, as he and his mother were forced to make a living selling straw mats and sandals. But despite this humble upbringing, Liu Bei showed extraordinary ambition as a young child, as there was a giant mulberry tree in Liu Bei's backyard, where if you looked from afar, it looked like the top of an imperial carriage. And when Liu Bei would play in the yard with his cousins, he would point to the tree and state that one day he will ride in a carriage looking just like that, hinting at his future imperial ascension. But at the time, his uncle, Liu Ziqing, scolded him for making statements that could get the whole clan killed, as obviously only the emperor can ride in the imperial carriage. Yet, not all of Liu Bei's uncles would think this way, as when Liu Bei was 15, his uncle Liu Yuanqi would see the potential in him as he offered to pay for Liu Bei to travel alongside his own son Liu Deran to the Jiujiang Commandery in the south to attend class under the esteemed Confucian scholar Lu Zhi, who also hailed from the Zhuo Commandery. Now, this was not a cheap trip. And Liu Yanqi's wife even complained about the added expense of paying for Liu Bei. But Liu Yanqi would defend his decision by claiming that Liu Bei was the future of their clan, as he showed the most talent amongst his generation. Sadly, Liu Bei's one-year tutelage under Lu Zhi in 175 would not result in much, as Liu Bei was not at all studious. Instead, he befriended his fellow student, Gong Sun Zan who was much older as the two of them would often skip class to ride horses, race dogs, and listen to music at the local inn. And by the end of the year, Liu Bei would return back to the Zhuo Commandery, none the wiser in terms of book knowledge, but more charismatic, confident, and mature, as it was stated that while Liu Bei did not talk much and did not show his emotions on his face, he was a great listener and was genuine and kind to others, which made him a natural leader as he started to build quite an entourage around him. Familiar names such as Jian Yong, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei would all be part of this entourage. But unlike the romance portrayal, Liu Bei's oathorn was not Guan Yu and Zhang Fei, but rather a young man named Qian Zhao, who was Liu Bei's Wen Jing Zhijiao in their teenage years. Now, Wen Jing Zhijiao is a term that literally means neck cutting oathorn, meaning that you are willing to lose your head together or die together. Guan Yu and Zhang Fei were not historically Liu Bei's oathorn brothers, as the Oath of the Peach Garden was a fictional event that only existed in the novels. But historically, they were still very close, even without the oath. As for Qian Zhao, because he was from the Anping commandery and not the Zhuo commandery, he was never part of Liu Bei's militia during the Yellow Turban Rebellion, which is why they would drift apart as the two of them were really just childhood best friends and nothing more. Eventually, Qian Zhao would serve under Yuan Shao, 
and Yuan Shang before finally joining Cao Cao and becoming quite the capable frontier general in his own right. And in the distant future, we'll definitely have a separate Let's Talk Lore series for him, but for the time being, our episode comes to an end, as we'll return next time to talk about Liu Bei's militia during the Yellow Turban Rebellion and his early struggles in politic. So hopefully you all have enjoyed this episode, enough to hit that like button to help out the channel, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!